I hope you're all feeling refreshed after the break. Uh, now we're going to go into our final section of the, uh, of the day, of the morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome Daniel Ninsima up to the stage. Uh, Daniel's worked as a mobile specialist uh, for L3F and is also a research assistant at Makerere University Agricultural Research Institute. He develops ICT applications and content for smallholder farmers in Western Uganda. He trains farmers on the use of ICT and content for smallholder farmers. Okay. He's the former Food Security Fellow for the US Department of State Food Security and a former ICT Fellow from Oklahoma State University and the Japanese International Cooperation Agency. Daniel's here to talk about his work with L3F and how they've responded to the needs of rural farmers with appropriate technology and education to improve their livelihoods. Dan Daniel will also talk about how the L3F are currently working to scale up their business. Daniel, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Greetings from Nepal of Africa. <laughs> My name is Daniel Isima, uh, just like uh, Matthew introduced me. Uh, he work with L3F Uganda under the Makere University Agricultural Research Institute. FF Uganda is a lifelong learning for farmers, which is an initiative uh, that is supported by the Commonwealth Foundation under the Commonwealth uh, Initiative to actually use ICT to deliver learning and disseminate information to rural farming communities in Uganda and other countries across Africa. This initiative uh, came out of a critical need to deliver content, deliver research findings to farmers who actually need to use it the most. We have impressive research that has been going on in Africa and other countries across the world. We have very impressive scientists that have come up with varieties that can improve production in Africa. But it only stops at the shelves of research stations and such uh, uh, organizations never travels the last mile to the farmers only to use this information. And that's a very big problem. So ICT is helping to disseminate information, disseminate research findings to travel its last mile to the farmers down there who need to use it the most. And that is what FEF Uganda is all about. ICT and FEF Uganda is about creating linkages and partnerships among the most important uh, partners in the agricultural sector. Talk of great institutions, talk of transporters, talk of traders and talk of farmers. We have so much research going on in different institutions, but it is all dislinked, it is all disconnected. We have two major institutions in Uganda that work on, on agriculture. We have the National Advisory Services and the National Agricultural Research Organization, NARO. But they all work for the farmer. But all their findings are disconnected. Yet they work to improve the livelihoods of farmers. So how can these two blend together to provide information to the same farmer they're working for to improve production and improve livelihoods of farmers in communities? And ICT can play that role to bring that gap. Just like any sub-Saharan African country, the extension system in Uganda has challenges. You have one extension officer who is supposed to serve 46,000 farmers. And these farmers have diverse enterprises. They are engaged in different enterprises. On an acre of land in Uganda, a farmer may have 12 enterprises. And imagine an extension officer who did, for example, animal husbandry. The farmer has uh, potatoes, the farmer has maize, the farmer has beans. How is he going to serve that farmer? So it's not possible at all. But the farmer has a handset. I'll look, I'll, I'll look at the figures of mobile phone subscriptions in Uganda, and they're very impressive. So these are photos taken from the field in, uh, in Kabale. And then we have local knowledge. Because we have this system of extension that has been existing for years, that is linear in, in a way. You have the research organization, you have the extension officer, and the farmer at the other end. So the farmer is always receiving information. He doesn't have any input into the system at all. 
But believe you me, there are practices that have worked for farmers for years. But the scientists believe they are the towers of knowledge. So there's no room for input for the farmer. When you look at the second picture, these are stone lines from Kabali. Conventional science tells us that stone lines are supposed to be laid across the slope. But these are actually laid along the cross, rather the, the slope. And this has been working for them. So imagine if you're a research guy from the university, then you go to the, the farmers here and you tell them, well, what are you doing is actually wrong. You should change the stone lines and lay them across the slope. Because science tells us so. But the farmers will tell you they have used this system for 100 years and it is working for them. So there should be room to integrate local knowledge into the extension system. And ICT can, can do that. This is one of our farmers that work with in Kabale. He has about two acres of land. And he look at all these diverse enterprises. He has rabbits, he has goats, he has bananas, he has different things. How will an extension officer who did animal husband be able to serve this kind of farmer? It's not possible at all. The figures in Uganda are very impressive in terms of mobile phone subscription. By the end of 2011, we had over 14 million subscribers. And we're talking about a technology that started back in 1996. The phone is everywhere. If you've been to Uganda, you will see Boda Boda riders riding on the bike with phones. You will see guys on bikes with phones. So the phones are actually everywhere. And they're being used for so many things, for sports, for entertainment. Why not agriculture? And their coverage is also impressive. Look at the figures. We almost have 100% covered in the country. So we have signals everywhere. So it's a fertile environment for technology actually to thrive. We carried out a baseline survey in 2009 to establish the information needs of the farmers. What do the farmers need to know? What do the farmers use the phones for? And we actually found out that 70% of the time the farmers are using their phones, it is actually for direct calling. They don't do much on SMS because most of them are actually literate. They cannot retrieve messages from their phones. They cannot be able to read them. But they know how to actually speak on the phone. And when they buy it, they don't have people come to teach them how to use them. They just learn by doing it. And then when you ask the information that we love to, to, to know and how they actually access information, we had different results on seed and planting materials, on pest management, on post-harvest handling, marketing, record keeping, solar and water conservation. Kabbalah is, is a hilly area that has very steep slopes. A lot of soil erosion and mudslides, killing people when it rains so much. And look at the sources of information. Radio, of course, is the highest because it's in every farmer's home. We have FM stations almost in every sub-county in Uganda. We have more than 100 stations now. But access to phones is also actually impressive. So we, we, the baseline survey was to understand what information do the farmers need to know and if they're willing actually to pay for it. So you can see soil and fertility technologies, market information, fertilizers, crop management, livestock improved seeds. And in Uganda, most of the people that carry out the hard work are actually women. When it comes to marketing, the men do it. Yet it's the women who toil to bring up the crops but it's time for harvesting and selling to get the money. It's the men who do it. So 
So the objectives of the service was to get information into the hands of the farmers, translate information, research information into a way that farmers can easily relate to and understand. Scientific research comes in a way that a common person cannot understand. They will talk of scientific terms that I cannot even understand myself. How about a farmer? So for this information to reach down to the farmers and be able to use it, it must be presented in an easy way that can be understood. And in their local languages. Our scientists have PhDs and master's degrees from the best institutions in the world. But the important thing is how their PhDs can relate and improve the lives of the poor people in our countries. It's not about their books and how many publications they've actually done. It's about how their science and knowledge can be able to translate into improved livelihoods for our farmers in African countries. That is what makes science important. So the system was to make the very research information accessible to the farmers in a way that can be easily understood and easily used. So we employed different technologies. We started by SMS. Because at that time, it was the easiest way to actually do it. Though, voice was actually preferable by the farmers. By that time, we didn't have a way to take care of actually voice responses. <clears throat> so here's the farmer looking at a message from our service that says, use neem trees to keep your grain safe. Dry the leaves, grind them, and mix with the grain in the bags that you want to store. It's a simple message, but it can actually save tons of grain. Because fertilizers are very expensive, and pesticides are very expensive as well. They are not affordable by the poor farmers. But they have their local knowledge that has been working for years. And that can save millions of tons of grain and beans in Uganda and Sub-Saharan Africa. So if you get that knowledge from one community and share that with other communities, it can make a very impressive difference. So let's look at the cost of the service. We have over five, actually over seven telecom companies in Uganda. And they're all competing for the same market. So that has, of course, a very big effect on the, on the prices of, of, of telecom services. So a normal telephone, or a normal SMS costs in Uganda is about 220 shillings. That is about $0.8. And for us to create a sustainable business model, we talk to the SMS companies. So we could, we could agree on some sort of share of an agreement. For each message that comes into the service, we take 50 shillings of that. So it was actually a one-time investment. And the system is actually taking care of itself because it can pay for its own expenses. So sustainability is not an issue now because the farmers are paying for their service. And they keep, of course, they ask questions. For example, one of the messages I selected from the system, the farmer is asking why their potatoes wilt at a time when they start flowering. And the other, this other farmer is asking, does planting lines increase my yield? So we receive different questions, of course, every day, and we have to respond to that. And our system is actually automated. We created some sort of keywords that identify specific information for our database. For instance, <clears throat> when a farmer types potato diseases, when it comes to the system, there's information that corresponds to that kind of keyword. So it is picked and automatically delivered to the farmer instantly. So I don't have to be there most of the time actually to respond to the SMSs or look for people scientists to respond to them. Because as time goes on, you'll actually find that farmers are almost asking the same questions. So you develop some sort of frequently asked questions and you can take care of that in the system. So when the SMS comes in, at a time when you're not around, even when you're there, it picks information automatically from the service and instantly is delivered to the farmer. 
So you don't have to wait for 24 hours or for an hour. It's actually just a difference of seconds or minutes. And it's delivered. And the farm, of course, get, get, keeps getting back because each season they grow different crops. And the conditions keep changing. We have issues of climate change. We have now different pests and diseases. So the farmer has to come back for the same information. This, this group of farmers were actually looking at something on tomato blight. And there was a, a, a way that was working in some communities in eastern Uganda that we, we actually got the idea on how you can actually control that by spraying milk. And it was working. That makes a huge difference. It spares money for the farmer that can actually take his children back to school, that can buy seeds for the next, half, the next planting season. But of course, like I said, SMS has its own limitations in terms of characters, in terms of farmers not being able to read them. And the farmers are more comfortable with actually voice because that is what they do every day. It's the, the land guide in the cities that can actually do SMS and tweeting and Facebook, but not the farmers down in the villages. They don't know how to do that. But they talk on the phone all the time. So we're actually looking for a way of how we could harness voice-based messaging to deliver quality-based information to actually farmers in a, uh, doing uh, farming. And this can be done in any other field. It can be done in education. It can be done in health. It's just a matter of changing the information that you provide. So we came up with an interactive voice messaging response system. And it has a very simple setup. Telecom companies spend billions of dollars to actually have interactive voice responses set up at their offices in countries where they actually work. But with this system, all you need is a desktop computer, or actually it could be a laptop, a GSM device, or a SIP device, you can talk of a um, mobigator or an office route device. And that is it. Because this device in, uh, in red, is it red or yellow, takes in four SIM cards. And this is what you give out to the farmers. So you upload information to the service, recorded files. So it's basically an interactive voice response system. When the farmer calls in, it will take him through the different voice menus available. Just like you call you, you, your card service system or your telecom company helpline, and they tell you to know about our prices, press one, to find out about our promotions, press two. So exactly this is the system, but now in a different context. So the system takes the farmer through the different options available in their local languages. So when they want to listen to something, they'll just press a key on their keypad and the information will actually be played. Then there's an option of leaving a recorded message on the service. So it can be a question, it can be an experience that I want to share with my fellow farmers. So I record my message and I hang up. The moment they hang up, the person on the system this end will actually see the message and they can listen to it. They can unload it. They can do anything with it. So you don't have to be there 20, all the time to respond to messages because the system is automated. It is available 24-7. You set it up and that is it. So you come back and check your messages, listen to them and respond to them because it has actually a dialer. All I have to do is collect the different numbers and make a database. So when I click by just a single click, I have the same information delivered to a thousand numbers. So they all ring at the same time. And when they pick, they listen to the same information. But it has to be sustainable because it will cost you money of course to call out. And this is why I want to head to. We want to involve the telecom companies. Just like we do the SMS, because we get a fee for each SMS that comes in. We should agree with the telecom companies so that for each call that comes into the service, there's a fee that comes to us 
to sustain, take care of the, the calling out, take care of other expenses. And if we can actually agree on that, then we shall have no other issues. Then I want to talk about traceability. When you set up the system, there was something that we wanted to do that we call uh, contract farming or collective marketing. One of the challenges the farmers faced was that they had this middleman that came in from the cities from Kampala and they bought their produce at very cheap prices because the farmers actually didn't know the prices. So they would go to each farmer and give them different prices because the farmers are not with the prices in the market. But because they're talking to specific farmers and the farmers have their problems, sometimes they would even sell the produce when it is still in the, in, in the gardens before they even harvest it. Because they're talking to each individual farmer, it makes it simple for them to take advantage of them. But when it is a group, it's very hard to do that. But when I have a contract with a telecom company, you must be able to meet the terms and conditions in terms of quality, in terms of timely delivery, because I have customers that are waiting for the, for, for, for the produce in Kampala and it must be delivered on time and the quality should be good. So I want to create a system to trust the different bugs and where they came from so that if there was a problem, we could actually be able to trust the specific farmer to find out why and be able to actually mitigate that. So what we did was that we assigned specific codes to the different farmers in the groups. So what I was actually doing here was I was labeling the bugs from the different farmers. So each farmer has a specific ID. <coughs> so when the buyer buys the produce and there's a problem with one of the bugs, they will text that back to the system with a farmer's code. Then we deliver that to the farmer's group and say, well, this farmer farmer's produce had, had actually a problem. You should take care of that. Then the group has its own mechanism of dealing with that. Maybe in the next consignment, one bug will actually be deducted to take care of the bug that had, had issues. That creates some kind of responsibility and organization. And first of all, it, is, it gives a good profit to the farmers because now they are selling their produce in kilograms, which was not available before. Back then, they were selling their produce in bags. Even when a bag had 120 kilograms, it, it would go for the same price. There was no difference. But now, because they're selling in kilograms, that makes it, that fetches more money for the farmer. And they need to meet the quality standards set by the contractor. So these are uh, pictures from the field. So we've been working with the Thailand farmers as a, as a pilot study. But now we've seen the benefits and we want to scale it up. And how do we do that? Because we have challenges. Sometimes when questions come in, because we don't provide a feed to the researchers, they don't give us audience that instantly. They will tell you I'm busy, they will tell you, I don't have time for that now. But the farmers want instant replies. And as long as you cannot do that, they will lose trust in the system. So we're now looking for ways of taking care of that. At least provide some sort of incentive to the researchers. So that they find value in providing the responses. We need to work with the national organizations involved in extension so they can actually integrate that into the national system. And I'm glad it is happening in Zambia. So that is what we're looking for in Uganda as well. So we have challenges, because currently uh, we have a, a single GSM device that takes in one SIM card. And of course, when you have farmers calling in on the same line at the same time, it has issues because the line is clogged up and sometimes when the farmer tries two or three times and they cannot go through, they give up on it. So we must find a device that takes in at least more than one SIM card and can receive calls 
more than one call at, 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 at a time. And the device is actually is available. We also need to promote the service because you must create awareness for your service if you need traffic to, to come in and flow. Because for the telecom companies to see sense, business sense in your service, it must have the numbers. This is where the interest lies. As long as you're attracting traffic to the network, then you have a business case actually present to the telecom companies. Then we also, because I work with a team of other people, and the sound provided on the phone must be a quality kind of service. It must be audible enough. So we need some capacity building on, in terms of developing audio and clear audio that is actually good for the service. I talked about integrating this into the national agricultural systems, the research organizations, and the national advisory services because it has the revenue, it has the money from the government, but it provides a poor service. You have one extension officer serving 46,000 farmers and you think that is a good service? Not at all. I talked about uh, the telecom companies coming on board because if you, pro you, you want to provide a sustainable service that can take care of it itself, you must bring the telecom companies on board. But as long as you have the numbers, they will listen. Because that is where they get their money. That means more money for them. That means more airtime being bought. And you have seven telecom companies competing for the same market. They'll have to listen, for sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a picture of, of, uh, of Kabale Islands, where we operate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Very good presentation. Uh, now, you, you mentioned so many different <coughs> points and so many talking points throughout that. Um, I just have one question to start with. Um, I think r regarding the, your, your position of trying to get funding for the scaling up of your business, you mentioned the marketing and things yeah, there. Yeah. I mean, could you give us a bit more information about your experience of trying to get money for marketing to, to expand? Of course, we've had challenges because the truth is radio is the best way to do your promotions because it's, it's available everywhere. And it's not expensive. But it's very expensive. <laughs> buying airtime and buying space on the radio is very expensive. So we, we have the Commonwealth of Learning taking care of some of the charges in terms of uh, buying the equipment and recording uh, the audio for that. But when you, we, we talk of scaling up, we're talking about possibly 50,000 farmers or a million or two million. And uh, it says it doesn't have that kind of funding available for now. So we've been talking to uh, development agencies and we're actually still looking out for partners to help us scale up the service. And it's just a one-time investment. As long as we can actually get a single time investment, you have the system taking care of itself, and we, we shall have it running. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other questions in the audience? Yes, in the white shirt. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. And I would like to ask, if you know the telecom operators, are they already offering internet over the network? Yes, they do that. OK. because. In this way, I believe that you could somehow you could avoid um, the payment that they have to do on the SMS every time that they use the network for sending SMS. Instead, <coughs> instead doing that, they could use internet, so they won't. They they just have to pay once a month or once a year. I don't know, and then they could have during the whole period of time that they already paid. Uh, the ability to communicate themselves or to gather even more information through internet. Uh, thank you very much. I would like us to understand the kind of phones our farmers have. They're very basic phones. They I cannot. Know, I know, but for example, 
I already have um, now. I have a Nokia. Yes. And it's quite old, but still, you could gather information from internet. I mean, emails, um, some other services like this. But it, I mean, it's, it's just an idea. It's, yeah. it's just an idea, and sure. I was wondering if they already offer internet. Yeah, internet, of course, is, is uh, we have telecom companies uh, offering internet, but especially to the urban folks. But, but internet uh, is actually a, a big problem in the villages. There is no connectivity at all. So that's out of the question when you when come to internet. In some places, especially in Kabale, th there is no internet at all. You have basically maybe one internet center in the entire district of about 1 million people, 900,000 pe 900, people. So it's, it's quite a challenge. But, but I mean, when we talk of scaling up, then uh, some places that have connectivity can actually do that. Sure. Yeah, in the red jacket. Hi. Thank you again for a really interesting presentation. Um, you touched very briefly on the, the gender perspective, talking yeah. about the women who do all the toiling and the men who then do all the marketing. How, what does it look like, I mean, in, in terms of mobile ownership? Um, men versus women, do, have you looked at that? Um, age groups, who, who, which, which market are, are you reaching with this? And is this changing things in any way? Well, in Uganda, in most African countries, uh, the men are the head of, of the households. And in most cases, of course, they are the people who own the phones. Though that is actually changing. Because we don't only do this. We do other capacity building uh, things. We do savings and credit. Uh, we give out small loans uh, at a, a rate of 1%. One, 1 and, and in these groups, actually, we found out that uh, the groups that are uh, comprised of, of women do much more better than the men. Maybe the men use it for, I don't know, for other things, drinking and stuff like that. But that is actually changing because when the woman actually has money, they can buy their own handsets. So that, that is changing. And of course, when the man sees that the woman is, is actually bringing food on the table, <laughs> that will change. They have to support them. Otherwise, they will actually <laughs> sleep hungry. So when they see value in what the women do, they will start changing that. And, and that is that we've seen that happening. And I believe it actually will continue happening, and, and that will completely change. But I want to press you on that issue. Sorry, I'm Caroline from Spider. Um, you, this pilot study you've been doing, or pilot that you've been doing since 2009, and you have a trace. How many women are actually calling in? Well, when you look at the figures, it's about 40% or 60. And you know, when ownership is different from access. The truth is, it's the men who have the phones, but the women can also access them. And, and, and make calls to the network. So we have different issues here. Ownership versus ac accessibility. So the women can access the phones, though they may not actually own them. Was there anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Ula. I work here at CEDA with ICT Fully. Um, you, you said, I think, on one of the slides that you, you started this pilot in 2009. Sure. And since then, you had received two text messages a week or something like that. Maybe I got that wrong. No, no, no. Okay. I, I just, I, I, I picked just, I, I could not, of course, have bring out the entire database of the questions that we receive every day to, to, to go into the slides. But it's w averagely, we receive about 100 text messages per week. A hundred text messages yeah, per week averagely, yes. from thousand farmers. Yes. Okay. And then I, I'm just wondering, is, is it the same kind of farmers who repeatedly ask questions or out of these thousand, how many have actually sent at least one uh, text message? Well, we, we work with a thousand farmers and we, we don't uh, do promotional campaigns on radio because we're limited in terms of resources. So much of the word out that I've been doing is basically in the groups that we meet every other month. So actually, it's... It juggles between the same farmers, the same 1,000 farmers using the system. But we, uh, we actually, when we talk of scaling up, we shall uh, kind of uh, 
take care of a bigger audience, promote the service on radio and, and so you can actually have a, a bigger audience. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. I just want to ask you, is there any other ICT related to, to, to this system of, uh, of, uh, of phones, like, uh, like radio, for instance? Is that involved also or not? At the moment, we don't use radio because, like I said, uh, radio was, is really expensive for us. We did that at the beginning with the service, but you know, if you want to promote the service, it doesn't stop at the launch of the service. It must be continuous to attract usage and attract users as well. So we, don't, we did that at the beginning to launch the service, but we've not done that actually. And that is one of the things that we're looking out for to actually promote the service on radios and have the word out to a big audience. So for sure, radio is a big part of this. If we, you're talking of, of scaling up. And I attended a, a training a workshop with Farmer Read International about a week ago. And uh, with radio, for sure, this service will, will achieve bigger goals. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you would take one more question. Uh, thank you for giving a very interesting presentation. And you have talked about radio, of course, yeah. and uh, SMS, and also IVR. But have you thought of anything relate, uh, relating to call center? Farmer will, uh, farmer can phone a particular person, and this particular person can s reply instantly, something like this. Because through this, you can customize your answer uh, uh, more efficiently than a computer-generated reply. Have you thought of anything like this? Well, we have f questions that come in that are not automatically re uh, replied to by the system that are actually answered to by, by a person. I look through the question, then I talk to a researcher who is actually an expert in that field, and they give it back, uh, we actually get back to the farmer. But you see, the cost of setting up a call center, for sure, trust me, is, uh, is it's quite expensive. So yeah, we may not afford, afford that. But yet there's actually cheaper of doing that. When the questions come in, I look for an expert who does that. Because I'm based at the, at the university, I get the response, and then I can s get back to the farmer instead of having a call center that is very expensive. Yeah, sure. That's an interesting point about the, the source of knowledge for, for, the, uh, for what is communicated. Um, okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Very good. Round of applause, please.